Hey folks, it's Dave Burroughs, uh, Chief Strategist at Barometer Capital Management. I want to thank everybody for joining today. Uh, it's been a really interesting week, uh, and it comes after a period where we've gone through uh, earnings, where there was great concern, uh, run up to, uh, to the next Fed meeting, um, uh, lots of things to worry about. Uh, and people have been voting with their feet. Uh, they've been uh, taking money out of the market, building cash positions, um, building up short positions against S&P futures, um, buying bonds uh, and low vol products. Uh, but interestingly, I think the market is set up to confound some folks uh, because the signaling I'm seeing is, is really quite interesting. Let's just start from the top as, as we always do. Um, there's a picture of the S&P going back to 1982. This is the secular bull market from 1982 or 81 through 2000. Uh, lots of uh, corrections and consolidations along the way, notably 1990-91 recession, uh, which lasted 18 months. All in, it was down about 20% at the worst point, uh, but ultimately resolved higher. And we got three, four great years uh, leading up to 1994. Uh, we have the secular bear market, the tech wreck in 2000 through 2003, and the financial crisis 2008 through 2009. Two periods, neither any of us would like to go through again. Um, and these are the things that concern people when you get into difficulty. That's a, a recession that turns into a credit crisis or some kind of systemic event. Uh, we broke out in 2013. Market's been rallying 123 months since then. We've been through a bear market that started in January of 2022. Uh, and over 18 months at the worst point was down 27% and challenged the 200-week moving average, which has been rising steadily all the way through the secular bull market. So our, our premise has been all along the way that this might well be marking down a recession, but there is nothing that points to a financial crisis or a credit crisis, and that ultimately we probably resolve higher. So we've now been over six months since the low in October, uh, market has been working its way higher ever since, what we call climbing a wall of worry. Uh, and along the way, you know, uh, I've had clients who, you know, get to the end of their rope, having read the newspaper and say, just get me out. Um, and certainly we've played a lot of defense along the way. But over the last number of months, things have been slowly and steadily improving underneath the surface. Um, last week was a big week. Um, the day before uh, Monday, so Friday, we had an 11 to one up day versus down. So 11 stocks up for every one stock down in the NYSE. That's the best market internals going back to the late part of last year. Uh, importantly, we broke above all kinds of resistance. And I want you to look at this price pattern, this pennant price pattern, where ultimately you tend to break out in the direction from which you came in and ultimately we broke out higher. Now we're gonna see a lot of these today, and I think that they're really important to take a look at because when we consolidate in an ever tightening range, when you ultimately break out, it tends to be, it gets an accentuated move in that direction. And certainly 11 to one up day is great. Now, we talked in our morning meeting yesterday, uh, and we have talked about the fact that over the last few weeks, we have had tepid breadth in the market We've been waiting for some resolution, albeit pretty fully invested. Uh, and when we saw that big day on Friday, we needed to see a follow through day. So what is a follow through day? A follow through day is where over the next five days, you get a move of greater than 2% on heavy volume uh, in an important part of the market. And today we had a pretty good move. So we'll talk about that as we go along. Um, Friday also was the very best day for small caps since November. So you had a greater than two standard deviation up move in the market. It way outperformed the S&P. And that comes on the back of relative underperformance for the average stock over the last number of months. It's been a very concentrated market with a small number of stocks, specifically the very large cap tech stocks leading the market while the average stock was underperforming. So a couple of things to take away. The market is now up 20% off the bear market low in October. 
So there's a lot of folks, including Mike Wilson at Morgan Stanley, who is dead convinced that there is another big leg down in the market. But this is the history from 1950. Anytime you had a bear market and you wound up up 20% from the bear market lows, when you went out three months, there was one negative period and that was in the 2000 to 2002 bear market. Six months out, the market was up in every case, an average of 18%. And 12 months out, the market was up on average 28%. So that would be 28% from here, 12 months out. And of course, every single one of them is significant. So that pointed to the fact that the bear market was done, even in the case where the market pulled back after the market was up 20%. That was a bear market where it was down 49%. So you gave up some of that significant recovery and then went on to new highs. Another data point, when the market is up 100 days off the low, a full year, for the full year, their returns were substantially higher and averaged 23.6%. So one of the reasons we've said to people, you just cannot go out and be, make a binary decision to go sit in bank deposits, which albeit pay you a better return than they did a year ago. You could give up several years of returns at those interest rates in the next year when the market makes its turn. So we talked about the fact over the last few months for the first time in many years, the rest of the world has been outperforming the S&P and that continues. So the S&P looks good, global looks better. We talked about the fact when the market was up outside the US more than in the US for more than a year at a time, in each case, it tended to last for a long period of time. And so that's something we've been watching for and talking about in our weekly webcasts. Let's just run through a few markets. This is the Nikkei 225, the Japanese index. This is a very long chart back to 1991, albeit the market in Japan went from 1991 to 2022, sorry, 21, without having made new highs. We consolidated after we broke out of this range over a period of months, a lot like a lot of other assets we're going to look at today. But in the last three months, the Nikkei has absolutely blasted off. Now, Nikkei trades at about 13 times earnings. It's less expensive than the U.S. Their earnings growth is in excess of earnings growth in the U.S. And there's a lot of companies trading below book value. And the Nikkei index have said to their constituents, if you're trading at book value or below, if you're not doing something to try and unearth value in the companies, you risk being delisted. And as it has become consensus in Japan that this is the thing to do, there are concerted efforts being made and there are catalysts being driven. There's a lot of interesting automation and industrial companies in Japan that are competitive on a world stage. There's a really important market that didn't make a new high for over 30 years. This is the Indian market. Again, broke out of a range, consolidated over the course of a year and is breaking out of this wedge pattern to the upside on a relative basis outperforming the US. This is, <clears throat> this is um, the, sorry, <laughs> this is mislabeled. This is the Mexican market. This is the Mexican e ETF, EWW, breaking out of a range. It's been in since 2017, making new highs. So we've talked about Japan, Argentina. Argentina, a more resource-driven market, a little bit more like Canada in a range from 2018 through 2022, broke out, consolidated, now breaking out to new highs. So just looking at it another way, this is from my friends at Strategus. They track the strength of a trend on the lower axis versus price momentum on the upper axis. So the highest one, Taiwan, has both strong momentum and a strong trend. You'll notice, a lot of the countries in the EU, Germany, Switzerland, France, Italy, the UK, strong trend. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got India, Brazil, Korea, strong price momentum. So a lot of global markets, US falls, 
uh, on the mid range on momentum and the mid range on trend, but the only areas worse are China and they have been underperforming. So global stocks, certainly an area that we care about. Let's talk about fixed income. Bond yields moved higher from the late 1940s through 1981. They moved lower from 1981 to 2020. We think we saw a secular low in interest rates in 2020. That probably is becoming consensus at this point. We had a sharp move higher in yields. And you can see what happened. Yields falling from 1981 to 2020, making a new high, and they've been consolidating over the last few months. But it is relevant that the TLT, which is the price for the bond, a long, US long bond, after consolidating over a period of months has broken down. So bond prices are falling, the moving average is falling, yet people have been piling into bonds all year long. So in our opinion, we've said this each week over the last number of weeks, until some of these things change, long bonds are in a bear market. So sometimes when there's a structural shift, the common consensus for what is risky and what is not risky can be turned on its head. And interest rate risk has been a considerable risk for certain parts of the stock market that we want to avoid. So there's the TLT. So despite the fact that stocks had a difficult year last year, bonds actually had a tougher year. And you can see stocks, the S&P relative to bonds continues to rise. And actually they made a new relative high in the last week versus the bond market. So from a top-down view, stocks in general are a favored asset class. S&P is acting well, global stocks within the, in the asset class acting a little bit better. Let's talk about commodities. Commodities in a bear market from 2008 through 2020 reversed, consolidated over a period of months, and these are starting to break out to the upside out of this consolidation. So actually, <clears throat> when we look at uh, commodities, when they start to outperform, they tend to outperform on a relative basis for periods of years. And this really looks like it's only just begun. There's gold versus the S&P we talked about over the last little while. Let's talk about some other commodities. There's uranium. This is the uranium ETF, URA, 2014 through 2021 bear market. Breaks out, consolidates. We're breaking out of this range over the last week. So there's a lot of these charts where they've consolidated and are now breaking out to the upside. This is the agriculture ETF, DBA. Not always the first place people consider investment, especially after a bear market that's lasted since 2008. Broke out, consolidated, now moving higher again, starting the second leg higher. There's lithium in the same price pattern, same long bear market. Now I can tell you these are not the places where investors have crowded in. These are areas that are under-owned, uh, unloved, and arguably interesting in a reflationary world. There's crude oil, it's the same picture. It feels like crude has been a tough place to be since May of last year, a one-year period where they've consolidated. The question is, will this be the next group to turn higher? Certainly something to keep an eye on. Commodities versus bonds. This is the broad-based commodity index versus the bond index. Broke out, consolidated, and within a whisper of breaking out to the upside. So I would say, given the choice, bonds would be something that we really want to avoid other than the use for short-term cash, equities an attractive place, and commodities interesting and getting more interesting. Real estate. Real estate investment trusts continue to have a weak relative performance versus stocks and weak relative performance versus bonds. We had a new relative strength low in the last week. This is an area that we're avoiding. This is an area that's hurt by higher interest rates. So from a top-down perspective, I think the key structural changes that happened over the last few years are intact. And a lot of them have to do with the US dollar. The US dollar was very, very strong through the course of the bear market leading up to October of 2022, where it made a peak. That's people looking for safety. US dollar started to back off. Risk assets started to do better. And they've been now trading sideways here over the last two, two and a half months, but we've been making lower highs. My guess is probably, given the moving average is moving lower, and we've made a lower high, my guess is we probably turn lower, and the indicators look that way. That would be 
supportive of commodity prices and supportive of global stocks. You would expect to see them, see the US dollar move lower versus the pound, versus the yen, versus the uh, euro, and that likely would be supportive of those types of assets. Okay, so we don't have to be everywhere. We have to pick our spots. At Barometer, we have a view that 80% of return comes from getting to the right neighborhood. Get to the asset class, it's got a tailwind. Right now, we believe that's equities and commodities. And then focus on the specific areas within that asset class that are benefiting from the current structural shift. So higher rates, not great for utilities and REITs and consumer staples. Um, they tend to be signaling more persistent inflation. That tends to be better for things like industrials and commodities and energy. 20% of return is finding securities within those neighborhoods to focus on to build our portfolio. So we use our top-down view, which tries to identify parts of the market that are showing expanding breadth where more and more stocks are participating. Our bottom-up work, trying to identify specific securities, looks for a combination of factors in the income statement and the balance sheet that point to positive change, things that are getting better, and price that would support that view. In other words, if we think fundamentals are getting better, but price is headed the wrong way, we think there's a disconnect. We want to see the technicals being supportive and fundamentals being supportive, on securities, and then we find good securities, line them up in groups within the market that have a tailwind, and that's where our portfolio should live. The third part is the most important part, and that's having a disciplined selling strategy. Now, I can tell you that during a transitionary period, this can be difficult. Over the last 18 months, there's been lots of ups and downs and lots of chop. And the cost of using stop losses is that sometimes you get whipsawed, you get taken out of positions before you'd like to. But we would rather err on making little mistakes, not big ones. So sometimes we get stopped out and we wind up having to put positions back on if the sector or theme reestablishes itself or the specific securities that we use to express start acting better than any others that we could choose. But making little mistakes as opposed to big ones is important because ultimately transitions complete and things start to trend and you get a long run in prices and that's what we look forward to. So we're always looking within a sector or theme for areas where we're seeing expanding breadth where more and more securities are participating. That's a healthy market. There's no bear markets happen when there's expanding breadth. And when there's deteriorating breadth, it doesn't mean we can't make money. It doesn't mean we can't be in a specific area that's acting better than the rest. But where we see deterioration, we reduce our exposure and we stop putting any new positions on. So it's okay to hold cash from time to time because it gives you opportunity. So a few things that are really important to keep in mind. <clears throat> Over the last while, the percentage of stocks beating the S&P has been as low as it's been since 1998 at the end of the tech boom. That was also a time when large cap tech was really the only game in town. And ultimately that did resolve and the market broadened out and lots of stocks started being the S&P. So last week we highlighted the fact that percent of stocks in uptrends in the NYSE had weakened over the previous few weeks, was sitting at around 40%. So 40% of stocks in uptrends, 60% not eligible for us to look at. And because it had been declining, we were sitting on some cash. The percent of stocks trading above their 50-day moving average had been moving lower. Percent of stocks trading with positive weekly momentum had been moving lower. Percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows was improving a little, and percent of stocks trading above the 150-day moving lower. So let's just examine those today. Over the past week, we've seen lots of positive change. Percent of stocks in the US in uptrends has moved up from 30% to 36%. That's expansion in breadth, it means more stocks are participating. Percent of stocks trading above the 50-day moving average, which going back to March was only 20%, is sitting today at 54% and rising. So greater than 50% of stocks trading above the 50-day moving average. Percent of stocks trading above their 150-day moving average, again, Going back to last October was as low as 
We pulled back in March to 34%. We're sitting today at 42%. So percent of stocks trading above their long-term moving average moved higher over the last week. And the percent of stocks with positive weekly price momentum over the last week and a half have moved from 40% to 56%, almost 20% more stocks with positive weekly price momentum. So what does that mean? It means that the market is broadening out. It means that we are becoming less dependent on just a few companies. It means that more stocks are performing well. It means that money is being put to work. And we've talked about the fact over the last few weeks, a tremendous amount of money has been pulled out of the market. A ton of money has gone into cash. A lot of futures hedges have been put on to protect against the risk of a big decline. Sentiment has been in the dirt. Yet interestingly, at the margin, more money's going in and coming out. Percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows also expanded over the last week. So all four of our short-term indicators getting better, our long-term indicator getting better, and that's on top of the fact that equities globally already had improving breadth. So here's the S&P. This is the high at the end of 2022, a series of moves lower into June, a rally to a lower high and a lower low in October. That ultimately was the low in this bear market. We rallied into December, pulled back at the end of December to a higher low, rallied, pulled back to a higher low in March, rallied, pulled back to a higher low in May. We now have all of the moving averages moving higher. And this past week, we broke out above the most recent resistance. We're now trading at the highest level we've traded at since August of last year. So I understand how unnerving the news is and how unnerving it is when experts tell us about how bad it's gonna get. And we are not able to see the future. We have to make the best decisions that we can. We just have to have methodology and process. And our process tells us to be invested at this point. Now the equally weighted S&P, the RSP ETF, had been underperforming the broader market, sorry, the market cap weighted at largest companies significantly over the last few weeks. And this was a concern. Last week, we said one of two things has to happen. Either we see deterioration in breadth and we see more stocks break down, or we need to see the market broaden out. The spread between the market cap weighted, the biggest cap stocks, and the equally weighted S&P was as differentiated as it has been over the last 30 years. Only 2020 was more significant and 1997. So as I said, on Friday, we had a two standard deviation move in mid cap stocks, the Russell 2000. That's very significant. Today, the follow through day, we had a 3% up move in the Russell 2000 today. So I said at the beginning, we need to see a big up day we had a day in between where the market didn't do much, but in the next five days, you need to see an up move of greater than 2%. And this has been the underperforming part of the market. Today, we saw it. This was led by financials, which were up, the, the regional banks up 5% on the day. So let's talk leadership for a minute. <clears throat> on the 26th of May, the average sector had 35% of stocks and uptrends. As we sit today at 36.4, breadth has been expanding. We talked about the fact that savings and loans and banks had shown improvement and went back to capital letters, meaning breadth was expanding. That was two weeks ago. That's continued. We've also seen some improvement in auto and auto parts. And we've seen improvement in various parts of the market. There's the XLK, which is large cap technology. Relative strength has been improving since the beginning of January. And our position in large cap tech grew over that period of time from virtually zero having gone through most of 2022 with almost no technology weight to 20% as it is today. And this has been a great group, of course, dominated by the biggest stocks like Microsoft, NVIDIA, Oracle, Apple, <coughs> uh, Avago, Broadcom, uh, and AMD. There's the Semiconductor Index trading better than 91% of companies over the last 52 weeks. Our largest firm position is NVIDIA. We also have AMD and Broadcom uh, well-acting stocks. But let's go outside that box. Let's go back to materials for a moment. I mentioned how the URA broke out of a consolidation. If you take the Cameco, which is probably the most important uranium company, the day that the URA broke out, 
Cameco made a new 52 week high. So that's something I always like to say, a leading stock should be like a beach ball. You can hold it underwater, but if you let go of it, it should pop back to the surface immediately. A leading stock should go back and make new highs very, very quickly. And literally on the first day of strength in commodities in weeks and months, Cameco went made a 52 week high. Very important, this is a new position that we added last week. CNQ, which we think is set up very well, and as much like Meg Energy, Imperial Oil, and Exxon, trading at the pinnacle of this consolidation range. My guess is we see that breakout shortly. Tech Resources had a very, very good week and very close to making new highs. We'll watch for that. The industrials broke out of a same formation consolidation, having made higher lows since the low in October. Again, breaking above that range. Green energy um, uh, equipment made a new 52 week high. The industrial renaissance ETF, which is mid cap industrial companies, largely driven by automation companies, very close to a 52 week high. ATS automation continues to act well. Financials. Now the financials have been the epicenter of weakness through the months of February and March. You saw that the XLF made a low uh, in March. And as of about 10 days ago, we said bullish percent or breadth had started to expand for the first time, made a higher low. Now, the strength within the group has been uh, the KRE. Over the past week, we went from breadth getting better, sorry, to price improving. We're still below the moving averages, and largely that's been driven by the regional banks. The regional banks, as of today, made a four-week high actually a six week high and trading above more most recent highs, but the insurance companies continue to perform well. We talked last week about Fairfax and IAG, Fairfax making a 52 week high. Consumer, home building, despite interest rates, is on a tear. The ITB has traded from 50 to $80 or $78 since October of last year against concerns of higher mortgage prices. This is home construction materials, the home construction builders, XHB is doing the same thing. So these groups are now starting to really lift. On the other hand, staples and utilities remain relatively weak. These are supposed to be defensive sectors, the places that people go to when there's concerns about the economy. They're making relative strength, new lows versus the S&P. Telecom, relative strength, new low. REITs, relative strength, new low. The reason I put that up is because there has been money pouring into the most defensive groups. That's the bond ETF breaking down. This was as of the end of May. Where had the money been going? Into bonds, consumer staples, cash, utilities, and healthcare. Where was money coming out of? US stocks, insurance, industrials, banks, materials, and energy. So, this is speculator positioning in S&P 500 futures. We are now at the lowest level of futures positioning or betting that the market will go down. The most significant short, uh, short interest in the S&P going back to 2007. So speculators are short the stock market. Bond positioning is as overweight as it was at the worst point in the financial crisis. Do you hear where I'm going with this? People are going to the wrong places. High beta or higher volatility stocks are outperforming lower volatility stocks. Yet, low volatility stocks are more expensive than high volatility stocks. My guess is the market is caught wrong footed. And it's hard to be patient with some of these sectors, but clearly, we're resolving in the right direction. From a firm wide position, we continue to have a heavy weight in large cap tech at about 21%. It is an underweight position to the market because we think there's other things to do. Financials are about market weight, heavily weighted towards insurance and the best banks, Royal and JP Morgan. Industrials are a significant overweight. Energy is a significant overweight. 
we do have some cash, which we've taken from our short-term bonds. We've got some short-term bonds. We've got an underweight in healthcare, an, an overweight, so a double weight in materials, an underweight in communication services, an underweight consumer discretionary, an underweight consumer staples, an underweight in utilities, an underweight in real estate. These are the most offensive sectors down here and higher beta sectors here. So we have to take our signaling from the market. I know there are concerns, but there's lots of great market-based signaling. When we look at VIX or volatility, this was the spike in volatility in 2020 when we kicked off COVID. These are the spikes that we saw through the bear market each time the market sold off. As of today, we are at the lowest level in volatility going back to pre-COVID. The market's normalizing. Credit risk is not showing its ugly head. When we look at the excess return that a bond investor is demanding to own corporate debt versus government debt, it's not showing strain on credit. The excess return is lower than it has been. It's way below where it was in 2020. So we think we continue to be in a structural bull market. We think we're continuing to put distance between the bottom of the bear market in October and the present. We continue to be above a rising 200 week moving average. We're seeing broadening participation in the market. Sectors that are under owned coming to life. Sectors where we think the risk reward is better for valuation and for the kind of environment we're in, a reflationary environment. And we have no problem getting defensive, but we really don't think this is the time and we are getting step-by-step step closer to moving away from being in a bear market. When the market's up 20%, it's considered that we are in a new bull market and we're up 20% off the lows. So continue to take this step-by-step. Step. We continue to try not to read the paper in too much detail, but more importantly, take the signal from the way the market's behaving. The setup that is built into the market tends to dictate where the market goes next. We know that we've been in a Fed hike cycle. We know there's been inflation. We know there's been COVID. We know there are geopolitical uh, uh, conflicts. We know that there are shortages in some materials. But the signaling in the market is, it looks like we're headed higher. Pamela, if you're there, and if there's any questions, certainly we can answer them. Hey, thanks so much, David. Yes. Um, we have a question here from Bill. He wants to know, David, with regional banks holding a large portion of office mortgages and office vacancies still high, will there be mortgage defaults and could this cause more regional banks to fail? And if so, how could this affect the market? That's it. That's a great question. The regional banks do have more exposure to commercial real estate. Um, and, and that is, you know, a concern. You know, we've said pretty consistently now for 18 months that higher rates are not good for real estate. Uh, and certainly the changes that happened during COVID are probably not great for office real estate in particular. Um, regional banks have been underperforming. We don't carry any regional bank exposure. Our banking exposure has been largely to JP Morgan and Royal Bank here in Canada. Um, and, and we would prefer to stay that way. Um, we don't have any REIT exposure where, in fact, we're short two REITs uh, in our macro portfolio. Um, so, yeah, I would be cautious. Um, we aren't seeing any real significant risk of default showing up in financial services. The capital ratios are pretty good, but certainly that can pressure uh, valuations for sure. Thanks, David. The next question comes from Sanjay. David, he wants to know what's your take on tomorrow's Bank of Canada interest rate? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting week because um, two countries that are not don't tend to be on the world stage, Canada and Australia, on deck for uh, rate decisions. And um, both signaled pauses. Um, Canadian data has come in stronger recently. Uh, and so the question is whether the... Uh, central bank uh, might raise rates. My guess is they likely won't, 
but what we are going to listen for is the verbiage, right? They are likely to come off being a little more hawkish than they have been. Um, we look really more, of course, to the U.S. Uh, Central Bank and, and Fed Chair Powell has been pretty clear that he thinks that they are probably, you know, set to pause uh, going forward, at least uh, temporarily. And the market is reading it that way. Um, so we'll watch for it. My guess is if if uh, if the Canadian central bank is a little bit hawkish, it probably is bullish for the Canadian dollar. And the Canadian dollar is the best performing currency versus U.S. dollar over the last three months. And we think the Canadian dollar firms up, especially if we think, you know, basic materials and energy prices can go higher, come out of this consolidation range they've been in. Uh, so it will be really interested more in the verbiage than, than the action itself. Thank you, David. Final question from Lawrence. He wants to know, David, would you buy the Russell or hand pick position? <laughs> Listen, uh, I think we are in a market where you can hand pick some great positions. Um, I would I would even lean outside of buying the Russell. And in, in our macro portfolio, I think we have a 3% weight in the Russell. Uh, but we have much more sizable weights in specific sectors. Um, I think that sectors really are going to drive things. And of course, you know, if you're a single stock purchaser and in most of the portfolios we run, we, we do rifle shot individual positions. Uh, there are leaders in each group. And so I think it's really important to look for those that are breaking out to new highs first. You know, the first stock to double in a strong group is going to be the first stock to double again. So there's great opportunity, especially as a private investor, where in a mid cap stock, you don't have to worry about liquidity. You know, it's easy to trade in and trade out. Um, so I'd be looking for some single single securities or, or you might build a, a little position in Russell 2000 and then add some single positions on top of that. Uh, we often, when our indicators turn positive, start with exposure to an index and then as we add individual positions, scale back our index weight and scale up our single security weights. Uh, and that's an iterative process. Thanks so much, David. Well, that concludes the questions we've received this afternoon. And I will leave you as always with the final word. Look, I, I get it that it has been a stressful market. Trust me, you know, we're, we're doing this every day. And, uh, you know, we read the news and we hear the analyst commentaries. Um, there's a lot of people talking their book based on how they're positioned. Um, and we try to stay balanced by just following the indicators that we follow. It's been a tricky year so far because so much of the return came from a very, very small handful of stocks. And of course, no portfolio manager has all their money in the biggest six stocks and none that I know of anyway. So I think most people have had a harder go to start this year. I do think it's really encouraging to see the broadening out. And I think it's really encouraging to recognize that there may be some rotation taking place. And just because we're seeing new sectors start to emerge or, or break out of their consolidations doesn't mean that tech can't work too. Our guess is we will see a broader and broader market as we move forward. So uh, tune in again next week. And if we see changes, we'll, we'll raise it. If you've got questions that we didn't answer, you know, reach out to us via email or, or phone. And uh, we'll be happy to jump on with you and answer whatever questions you have. And uh, if you're a client, thanks for being a client. If you're not a client, well, maybe you should be. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you all later.